In today's video, we are talking about newly diagnosed prostate cancer patients who are hormone sensitive, but do have metastatic activity. And typically what is offered is combination therapy, which is radiation, hormone therapy, and chemotherapy. But some patients don't wanna take the chemo or have questions about it. So today we're gonna to talk to Dr. Mark Schulz, who's a 30 year medical oncologist who is focused solely in prostate cancer. And we're gonna talk about chemotherapy alternatives and the ins and outs of your options. So today we're talking about newly diagnosed patients who have unfortunately had metastatic activity upon being diagnosed. So it's not localized to the prostate, it's sp spreading around the body. And one of the things that is an option for them that is often uh, coming up with doctors is combination therapy. So there's radiation therapy, there's hormone therapy, and chemotherapy. Now, when we think of chemotherapy in the greater media scape, you know, you'll watch movies and you see that um, once someone gets cancer, they're on chemo, and you see the horrible side effects a lot of times dictated within these movies. However, chemotherapy and prostate cancer is quite different. But because of those images that we've all seen, a lot of patients have asked, is there an alternative to either not doing the chemo at all and just doing the radiation and the hormone therapy, or is there an alternative to the chemotherapy itself? Can I do PARP inhibitors or Puvicta or any of these other things? Um, that uh, would maybe lessen the toxicity of the chemo. Because if you're taking hormone therapy plus the radiation plus the chemo, the toxicity being the side effects is quite intense. So, you know, can you kind of walk us through the staging and also why the doctors are giving combination therapy to these patients? A basic tenet of oncology for many years is if the researchers are able to elucidate a treatment that really has anti-cancer efficacy. That same treatment will give more bang for the buck if it's given at an earlier stage rather than waiting for the disease to get momentum more advanced. The treatment will have efficacy in the more advanced stages, but it won't have as big a benefit. We're talking about benefit like survival benefit. Treatments that are given early on may have a survival benefit of several years. Treatments that are given as a last ditch effort may only add three or four months to their survival. So it has efficacy, but not the same leverage. So there's often a push-pull decision-making process, since we know that chemotherapy in particular has side effects. Is the upside, is the improvement in survival uh, enough to justify the side effects? What we call chemotherapy encompasses a broad range of medicines and combinations. Taxotere, which is the most popular medicine for prostate cancer, is also used to treat breast cancer and lung cancer and other cancers. But for prostate cancer patients, convention usually indicates that the dose of Taxotere will be about only 75% of what is given to a breast cancer patient or a lung cancer patient. And in addition, the lung cancer and breast cancer patients will get other chemotherapy agents at the same time. So they may get two or three chemotherapies in one sitting, whereas a prostate cancer patient will get a 75% dose of Taxotere. Relatively speaking, as chemotherapies go, the intensity of chemotherapy for prostate cancer doesn't typically match up to the intensity for other cancers. In general, although it's not a pleasant experience, many people can get through it pretty easily. I tell patients that are kind of vacillating about whether or not they want to add the Taxotere onto the, you know, the treatment protocol to consider trying one treatment. Everyone reacts a little differently, their biology is different, and if they do indeed find that it's tolerable, then to continue it on for four to six cycles, which is the usual prescribed amount. The whole issue of using chemotherapy in uh, newly diagnosed metastatic disease is based on these realities that if Taxotere is given at the get-go in men that have sufficiently dangerous disease that they might die, and that's really important. As we know, most prostate cancers aren't dangerous enough to kill you, but some are. And the people that do have that type of more dangerous disease, the five-year survival rates can be substantially improved by the early use of Taxotere. The argument is very, very much in favor of if you can handle it, do it. That has been proven in well-designed studies. There does come an issue though, for example, what if someone doesn't have multiple bone mats all over their body? These are the people that we do know are certainly at risk for dying within five years, but maybe they only have a few lymph nodes. Uh, that situation in some studies uh, has uh, benefited by early tax tear as well. And the thing to consider in those patients is not whether or not you're going to live five years. Almost everyone's going to live five years. Probably almost all will live 10 years because of the efficacy of hormone therapy and radiation. One difference will be whether or not the initial treatment results in a cure. Getting cured 
is a big upside, not having to deal with the disease coming back after you stop the hormone therapy. You have the radiation, have the hormone therapy. Unfortunately, the disease starts coming back in two, three, or four years, and you're back to starting over more hormone therapy, more radiation therapy. Some of those men who have a course of taxotere will cross over from not being cured to being cured. This is a more difficult uh, equation trying to figure out is the upfront toxicity of the taxotere doing it now worthwhile enough by, let's say it improves my cure rate from 50% to 65%. Uh, someone that has, uh, you know, Gleason 8 or 9 lymph node disease in their pelvis, undergoing radiation, combination hormone therapy with Zytiga and Lupron, for example, or Orgovix, they could bump their cure rate up maybe 10, 15, 20% with the uh, taxotere. But the taxotere comes with a price in terms of tiredness, potential hair loss, and other side effects. This uh, balancing act uh, is, involves a careful conversation with the oncologist, and one might consider the possibility of taking a single treatment to see how some men really kind of breeze through it. Other men, it's really hard on them, and uh, everyone's different. Before I get to my next question, I just wanted to remind you that this September we're having an in-person prostate cancer patients and caregivers conference, and it's a great way to get your questions answered by world-renowned experts. You can learn more at pcri.org forward slash conference. Now, don't forget to click that subscribe button and share these videos with other people. It's a great way to support the work we do, and if you would like to support us financially, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Schultz. So can we walk through some rapid fire questions really quick, just to make sure that we're covering some of the questions that we get on Helpline. Can people be allergic to chemo? They certainly can. It's fairly rare. Uh, there are all kinds of precautions that are taken and the administration of tax tear is always under the supervision of nurses trained in giving chemotherapy. It's very safe, but uh, there are occasional patients that will start on tax tear and have to stop it because they're literally allergic to it. The other chemotherapy we see in prostate is Jevtana. So is there a difference between Jevtana and tax tear as far as effectiveness goes? Effectiveness is, uh, in the comparative studies that have been done appears to be equal. There is trend towards Jevtana having fewer side effects. It's not a dramatic difference, but it is typically a little better tolerated when you query patients afterwards. Interestingly, there's a minority of people that tolerate Taxotere better. So it's part of the, just the biology of our individual makeup varies from patient to patient. But as a general rule, the Jevtana tends to have somewhat fewer side effects. Speaking of the biology of the patient, one of the things that we've seen recently in, in our an article we'll share in the comment section is that the Decipher score can actually give you some information regarding chemotherapy side effects. Would that be relevant in this situation? I think it could. There's so many different variables. How old is the patient? There's other factors, and not only how many metastases are there. Some patients may elect to look and determine whether their PSA goes down to zero within the first four to six months of starting Zytiga and Lupron. The hormone treatment is quite efficacious. So people that get an undetectable PSA clearly have a better prognosis than those that don't. Anyone that fails to get a, a PSA nade or less than 0.1, I, they should all be on Taxotere. Men who are initially diagnosed with the, you know, they may have a PSA of 50, 100, 150. When it's higher, of course, the chances of getting the PSA down to less than 0.1 is going to be reduced. And we know that the men that can't get their PSA down to, to less than 0.1 within six months have a worse prognosis. They're dealing with early hormone resistance. So it's very logical that those all of those men with high PSA nadir should get taxotere, and every effort should be made to get the PSA down to less than 0.1, which we call a complete remission. Are there any pre-existing conditions or com comorbidities where patients maybe wouldn't be good candidates for chemotherapy? I had a patient last week who has early Parkinson's disease, and the neurologic effects, the concerns that there may be um, modest but real memory issues with Taxotere. In someone that already has some neurologic deficits from a disease like Parkinson's disease, I'd be very concerned. Sometimes you have no choice. If someone has a high PSA nadir or multiple cancer spots, uh, the prudent thing is to start the Taxotere and see how it goes. You can always stop it if you start to see side effects that you don't think would be acceptable. As far as chemotherapy side effects go and the idea of stopping it um, before they go too far, are all chemotherapy side effects reversible? For the most part, they are. There are lingering questions about uh, the impact of uh, taxotere on memory, and this is with any so-called chemo brain. It's not a prominent thing in my experience, kind of hard to gauge it, but 
And I think most of the talk about what's the so-called chemo brain issues are related to you know, higher doses of combination therapies in people with other types of cancers. But it's, all, it's been researched in prostate cancer, and that concern is out there. Apart from that, uh, other side effects should be reversible. Hair loss is reversible. The fatigue that comes with treatment is reversible. People get some funny taste issues. That's reversible. With appropriate precautions, it should blow over when you're done, and you should come back to normal. So in some patients that I've seen call the helpline, there are some that are adamantly against taking chemo. They want to do the radiation, they're okay with the hormone therapy as long as it's maybe a shorter course. But when it comes to the chemo, because of you know whatever decisions led to that, they don't want to take it. So if they're not going to take chemo, what other options would they have as far as treatments go? Well, I think one underutilized approach now that we have these PSMA PET scans is to uh, embark upon the combination hormone therapy and the radiation to the prostate and the surrounding lymph nodes. But if they don't get a complete remission, let's say they have 20 spots on their bones, but 17 or 18 of them disappear with hormone therapy, but a couple don't. Those residual spots can be treated with radiation and sterilized. So spot radiation as coming over the top to go for any residual disease is a logical step. Doing genetic uh, testing in everyone to see if there are any BRCA mutations. Perhaps they'd be more amenable to an oral chemotherapy called Limparza or one of the other PARP inhibitors to utilize a type of perhaps milder chemotherapy. There are immune therapies out there, off-label immune therapies, that could be considered unorthodox approaches. To be thinking about what more can we do in these men that have known metastatic disease, I think is a logical approach. I don't know, there's no real formula for it, but uh, because we know that earlier treatment gives better results than delayed treatment. In other words, giving the hormone treatment, perhaps stopping it, seeing if the cancer comes back, and then restarting everything further down the line probably won't have the same leverage as treatment that's used up front. One of the current uh, treatments that we see in late stage disease is Pluvicto 177, Lucilutetium. And currently we see the indications for having to have at least started chemo, but we do know that they are working towards or are currently in, in process of getting an indication which would say you don't have to do chemotherapy at all. So in these combination patients, do you think that we'll start seeing patients who do hormone therapy, radiation, and Lutetium-177? My guess, and this is very early, is perhaps not. I've always been uh, very energetic about getting later stage treatments into earlier therapy, but radiation, when you administer it to the whole body, it's not a small undertaking. And the dose of radiation that gets to the lesions is not as high as when they do beam radiation. So you get a lot of exposure. You can have some lingering bone marrow problems, sometimes some kidney problems from the Pluvicto. There are some studies that are looking at men with oligometastatic disease where they get the visible disease radiated with beam radiation, traditional, it's actually a very new approach, standard in my practice, and then get a couple squirts of Pluvicto afterwards to see if it goes after any microscopic disease. And I've had a couple of patients treated on those protocols and it doesn't, it's not magical. I'll withhold final opinion, but I'm not optimistic that Plavicta will be the answer in that situation. There are other injectable radiations coming along, like actinium. Actinium seems to be even more potent than Plavicta is, and would that be able to be utilized in this setting? Maybe. It's pure speculation, but for the time being, I'm not suggesting it. As These treatments actually are available outside the country. They're expensive, but men in theory, could go to another country and get Plavicto if they uh, wanted to pursue it. I am not advising that, but it is available. One of the questions that we also received is that if there's somebody who does take the chemo and they do all three, radiation, hormone therapy, and chemo, and let's say that they um, they do for a certain amount of time, see that PSA you know, go down to an aider, but the cancer comes back, can they take chemo again? They certainly can. Optimism that it'd be useful would be greater if there was a fairly long time period between Let's say they were treated in 2022 and they had all this and now it's 2027 and they see, you see an early rise in PSA. These days, uh, in those delayed patients, usually the cancer is only coming back in a couple of spots and we'll usually not think of more chemo, but we'll think of giving uh, spot radiation. But the idea of recapitulating chemotherapy at a later date, years later in recurring cancer, is, has been studied extensively in colon cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer. And if there's an adequate interval between the initial treatment and the subsequent treatment, chemotherapy is quite likely to be 
helpful or useful. One of the things we've heard you say in previous videos is that the impact of anti-cancer effects are really in the first four cycles versus the entire six of chemo. So maybe shortening chemo, is that an option? I tell patients to get through four treatments because I think the lion's share of the benefit is in the first four treatments and the lion's share of the side effects is probably the last two treatments. If people are just bopping along and doing great, most of the studies that look at the advantages and disadvantages of chemo use six cycles. That's kind of the standard, but you're not locked into that. There are also other strategies that should be mentioned to reduce side effects from medicines such as taxotere and gefitana, cold caps to prevent hair loss, keeping ice on your tongue to prevent uh, changes to the uh, taste buds. While the chemotherapy is circulating in the bloodstream, having ice on your tongue shunts blood flow away from your mouth, taste buds don't get as exposed to the taxotere in your bloodstream. There have been issues sometimes with the fast growing cells and by keeping your fingernails cool and shunning blood flow away, it can help preserve normal fingernails uh, during treatments. Years ago, it was very popular to give taxotere in small weekly incremental doses rather than one big bolus every three weeks. And men typically tolerate that much better than getting a larger amount. It's more convenient, less doctor visits to get a, a three-week cycle, which is the typical administration. Weekly doses where they'll give a third of the dose each time is a milder and gentler way to undergo this treatment, and, and it's effective. When you do chemotherapy, there's some risk of infection. There are medicines now that'll boost your immune system, uh, such as Nulasta or Danica, medicine that can be administered the day after the chemotherapy or even the day of and lower the risk for infections. Typically, men are given some cortisone during the day before the day of and the day after the infusion, and that softens the blow. Cortisone's kind of that second win hormone that marathoners get around the 18th mile. It alleviates discomfort, gives you strength, and it can be given in a pill form. Extending that beyond two, uh, one day after the treatment, out to three or four days sometimes, will kind of carry people through that time period. The first three to seven days after the infusion are usually when people feel kind of fluey and achy and tired. And then lastly, the uh, studies, as have been clearly demonstrated for hormone treatment and for radiation treatment, men who pursue regular fitness and, and continue to exercise, even in the face of feeling like a limp dish rag from chemo or whatever, do much, much better compared to the people that don't pursue fitness. Just laying on the couch and recovering from uh, the treatment rather than getting out and doing some lightweight lifting, not trying to set any records, just trying to stay active, really mitigates the side effects to a large degree as well. We have some long form videos that other doctors have done from our conferences on combination therapy. They're world renowned experts and they do a great job breaking down what combination therapy is and the stages of prostate cancer in which it, it would be applicable. And we also have some great videos from Dr. Scholz on it as well. And we're gonna go ahead and link them in the comment section below this video so that you can further your education when it comes to these treatments. You know, as you layer on these different treatments, you do have a lot of side effects that kind of come with them, especially combined. And so it's just good to know what to expect ahead of time from the radiation, from the chemotherapy, from the hormone therapy, and how to mitigate those side effects. At the end of the video, Dr. Schulz talked about a fitness regimen, and really what he's talking about is weight training. It's really important to keep your muscles strong through this process as much as you can, and we do have a weight training protocol that we'll also link in the comment section. And it's just a simple protocol, something written down for you to look at in order to get yourself to muscle exhaustion through those different moves. But it's a great way to just kind of have a basis of what to look at as you do them two to three times a week. It can be very effective in helping you kind of get some energy through the entire chemo and hormone therapy process. And we find that as patients do weight training through these different treatments, um, they do handle them a bit better. And so even though, as he said, you may feel like a limp dish rag and it may be really difficult, I would encourage you to get a friend to do it with you, maybe a partner, somebody, go to a gym, hire a trainer, a virtual trainer. There's a lot of resources online. But whatever it is that would motivate you, it is important. And you are important. We care about you. We want you to know that you're not alone through this process. And any help that we can give, please you know, leave ideas for us in the comment section below if you have different ideas for resources or videos that we can create. We want to be here for you as much as we can. We appreciate you watching this video. And I hope you